Coming up on Digital Music Trends 215, on the 15th of January 2015, and that's a lot of 15s, we discuss CES Music Gadgets, Deezer buying Move Music, Spotify reaching 15 million paying subscribers, and I interview the head of Iceland Music Export at Eurosonic. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and this week it's going to be a bit of a special show uh, because I'm going to be in uh, Groningen for uh, Eurosonic uh, for the most part of the week and we're going to record a couple of uh, interesting uh, interviews over there which are going to follow uh, my chat with uh, uh, Vicky Norma right now. So hi Vicky and thanks for joining me today, uh, former president uh, of North America for Seven Digital and now consulting for a bunch of different companies. So hi, Vicky, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's great. It's really great. I'm recovering from CES, but uh, other than that, I'm good. It's great, and it's going to be great to talk to you about CES. We covered uh, a, a couple of very, very uh, <coughs> narrow points uh, last week, but obviously I wanted to wait for you to uh, join me on, on the show to talk about that. And uh, uh, after uh, Vicky's, uh, uh, the chat with Vicky, we're going to have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a few other interviews. Uh, uh, they're going to be finalized whilst I'm, I am in Groningen. This has been recorded beforehand, and so uh, stay tuned, uh, and I'm sure I will add uh, those names uh, to the actual intro of of the show uh, uh, during uh, the, the music portion of it. And uh, so Vicky, let's start off with the CES. Uh, I, I really, I would like to go at some point in my life, uh, but uh, I haven't quite managed to justify it uh, yet. How have you found this year? Have you f found it this year? Well, this year was great. <clears throat> and I, um, I've been going for many years. When I worked for Sonos, I went there. When I worked in radio, I went there for all the radio things. And then also with some digital. And, um, and this year, I, it was, I kind of do a ninja mission because I drive there. I'm from Los Angeles, so I can drive there. I have my car and I can just go from hotel to hotel for meetings. I don't have to hassle with with cars, so um, it's a bit of an, uh, it's a bit of a uh, 360 degree challenge for me to go to CES and do lots of meetings and then blast out of Vegas as, as fast as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, but it was really good, and um, I spent a little bit of time in the main halls, which is where all the big brands, you know, Samsung, Toshiba, yeah. Microsoft, all of the big companies are there. Um, or more established companies, um, did a lot of meetings. And then I also went over to the Sands Expo, which was substantial in and of itself. But that's where all the wearables and advanced technology and not quite yet vetted and proven ideas and companies are displaying their wares. And I had an absolute ball that sounds, in there all day amazing. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds fantastic and really this year for me I mean maybe it's because I follow a lot of news feeds but it, it did really feel like it was the year of the music hardware uh, to a certain extent there mm. seemed to be a lot of stuff out there uh, so uh, talking about that what what grabbed your attention well that's I think that's a I think that's a really good good point because okay so you know I'm I have an I have a biased opinion because I worked at Sonos for two and a half years and um, and when I was at Sonos that was 2007 to 2009 there was really no category for multi-room audio right. or the connected home it just wasn't there yet and we really established that entire vertical and Sonos has done such a good job with that um, there are a lot of companies that are going after Sonos now yeah. And they see that there's a, they see that there's now a, a viable category. There's, you know, channels for it, and they're introducing products. Um, a lot of the products sound really good, uh, but the, the the devil's always in the details, and it's when you try the product out, whether you know that whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. So lots and lots of Sonos competitors. Um, but there were a couple that I wanted to mention that I that I saw that I thought were doing some really interesting things. There's this company from the UK, Mosaic. Let's see if you can see that. Let's see their logo. Mosaic, um, I haven't heard of them. Yeah, have you haven't heard of them? No. Okay, so they are a, they're a, um, a smart hi-fi, Wi-Fi. So their they're box is similar and they're, they're connected speakers. Um, the thing that <clears throat> they won an innovation award this year, and what I think is interesting about them is that they are, you know, they have really good sound quality and all the things that you would expect from a music system, but they also integrate with smart lighting companies right. into the home. And so, uh, you know, a lot of, it, you know, it, 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 you reach, a, it, you often reach a gadget threshold in your home <laughs> where you have, you know, how many remote controllers do you want? How many devices do you want? Yeah. So this is interesting that they're, that they're trying to integrate 
with different home lighting yeah, systems. It's lovely to see a bit of convergence in that department because uh, I can imagine that even now, it's gonna be, I think it's going to take another two or three years before we s really start to see companies work together to, to create a, a standard for, for uh, the connected home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and we've already seen Sonos make a little bit of a shift where they had their mesh wireless network yeah. and then this year they announced that you were able to run the system without a mesh network. Um, it does still improve performance, so I think it's still an advantage when you have a home that's got, you know, like, like in the UK, where you have a home with stone walls, um, it's, pretty hard to get a, <laughs> it's pretty hard to get a signal through that. Yeah. Um, another company that I met that was also really interesting was Box Talks, and, um, and that is, um, they have a product that's out there from France, and they have a product that, that, that's out that's very sleek box, and they claim to be able to not only play FLAC and 24-bit audio, but be able to transcode uh, streaming services into higher quality audio. Now, wow. of course, bold, I talked to their engineering claim, manager. Oh, oh, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I said bold claim. I know, I know. Well, bold claim, and of course, me being who I am, I thought, well, I'm not going to interrogate them about whether the major music labels are okay with them transcoding the audio quality. <laughs> Of their files, but maybe they maybe they've already gotten clearance on that. Right. Um, so that was that was really interesting. And then there's a then there was another little little company that was doing this kind of crazy thing um, where it it's a it's essentially a triangle that sits in the middle of all of your systems, and it in and of itself listens to all of your behavior and knows when it's morning, afternoon, evening, and, and pays attention to the differences in the types of music that you listen to, and then adjusts your Spotify or Deezer playlist accordingly. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, and talking about triangles, uh, how, how did you find the reaction? I, I know that the Pono uh, held a lot of attention on the show floor. Uh, did you hear people talk about it? What, what, what was the impression of it right, right now? Yeah, you know, and I and I met with the Pono guys. I got to know them a little bit over the last year, yeah. and um, and I, I mean, a lot of naysayers, lots and lots of naysayers out there saying, you know, it's it's so contrarian that they're doing downloads. It's um, you know, it's another device. It is a you know, it's it's you know, it's questionable you know, whether or not, you know, consumers are going to adopt it to the point that it'll become anything except a paperweight. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I, I think that a lot of people are saying, no, that this will never be successful. Um, I heard Neil speak and I also talked to the Pono team and, um, and they're talking about also licensing their technology out to mobile handset providers or laptops to be able to enhance the audio, audio quality of any files that you have. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the the, I think that the biggest win that Pono will be able to have, and I think they're already experiencing this, is that they're that someone of Neil's stature can yeah. stand up on stage and say things about the importance of audio quality and hearing music as artists intended it to be heard. He can say that like nobody else can. Yeah. And um, and so I think that's a huge victory in and of itself. Yeah. And. Um, and, you know, I think the jury's out on, on where they'll go from Kickstarter and their 1.0. Um, they, they have a smart team, um, but I'm also seeing, in, you know, reflective of the music industry, there's also a lot more companies out there that are working to build out different parts of the ecosystem for higher quality sound and for right. better audio, which is great because I, I firmly believe that it will make a difference in people's listening behavior. Yeah, and uh, uh, obviously we're going to keep uh, watching the uh, electronics market to see what's going to happen uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, this, uh, this you know, focus on, on Wi-Fi audio and Bluetooth audio, both on a headphone uh, uh, side and, and on the, on the uh, speakers side, will actually lead to also wider adoption of streaming services, so that that could be also another interesting point to see because of this focus on integration uh, with different services, whether uh, once these speakers become mainstream, that is also becomes another driver for streaming services to sell more subscriptions. Exactly, exactly. And speaking of Bluetooth, I did want to mention these guys. This was another thing that I was blown away with. 
Um, I'm going to hold this up to the camera if you can see that. Right. So it is. Um, it's it's a company. It's a new company called Soin Audio, and this is a speaker called Transit, and it is a Bluetooth speaker. <clears throat> now, I'm not a fan of these little Bluetooth. colorful, cute Bluetooth speakers <laughs> that are that just sound terrible. They sound like the transistor radios that I had when I was a child in the 70s, you know? I was trying to find mine. And I've got one somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this company, Soin Audio, is really interesting because they are um, they're former Harman people. Right. They worked on, there's a, is a, is a core team that built a lot of the Harman products. They have some Harman advisors and their entire business is around taking great sound and shrinking it and making it small. And so they gave me a demo and it was just a very ordinary hotel room in the Venetian um, of a sound bar that they have under production as well as these little Bluetooth speakers. Right. And we did an A-B against some of the other leading Bluetooth speakers and it's surprisingly better. It's warmer. It doesn't have that tinny sound. They were just playing something, a file off of iTunes. It was nothing, nothing extraordinary. Yeah. And um, and I, you know, I think they want to sell. I think they want to sell Bluetooth speakers or these little things in airports and various different places at fairly low price points. But I think the really interesting thing for for a company like this is whether or not they're going to be successful at getting these little speakers integrated into laptops, televisions yeah. that sound terrible, and other things, other form factors that are so thin and so small um, that they don't currently, they just kind of tossed out yeah. audio quality. And, and a company like this with speakers, you know, some of them are like, you know, they're like the small and they wow. sound really good. Nice. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, so I was excited about that. That's very cool, and I guess the the, the real issue with those companies is that people look at a, a stack of uh, different tiny speakers at, at a, an airport's uh, store or any electronic store, and it's just no way of of playing them. So essentially, you have yeah. to rely on uh, web reviews and 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 on, on that kind of input in order to make your decision. But if you're just there and trying to pick one, it's really hard to have a competitive advantage if you're not a known brand. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that is that is a challenge. So then, you know, where they're sold, the the channels that they're sold in, they're they're pretty smart because they're they're not going to big box retailers. These guys are in Apple right. uh, stores and they're also like apparently I didn't know this, but Whole Foods, which oh. is, you know, a big, you know, whole paycheck wonderful grocery store that sells uh, high quality organic goods. Um, apparently, they started selling vinyl in five stores in Los Angeles, and nice. I need to go and see this. But they were also selling these speakers. So, so I think that they're you know they're trying to get non traditional channels and places where uh, consumers who would probably be buying quality goods would see their brand, and I think that's smart. Awesome. Well, Vicky, thank you so much for that update on CES. And I wanted to move on to talk about a couple of stories that came out this week uh, that I think are, are really interesting and important to talk about. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, Deezer's entry into the US market properly after they uh, did a, a launch for a very limited number of people who would be willing to pay $20 a month uh, for their high quality service called Deezer Elite. Uh, uh, Deezer uh, essentially acquired Move Music uh, from AT&T uh, slash Cricket. A bit of a weird acquisition because it won't actually inherit all of uh, Move music customers but they will be given the chance to transition into Deezer and they will be given a discounted price on the subscription rather than being migrated and, and, and the price being worked into the, the, the mobile uh, subscription itself uh, but a, a challenge nonetheless to, to Spotify and the likes because Move Music already has a pretty big uh, customer base. The, the, the only issue is really convincing that customer base that it's worth continuing to pay for music uh, as a separate item on their bill. And, and the second story being the fact that Spotify has now reached uh, 60 million uh, free users users with uh, 15 million of those uh, being paid users so uh, Spotify maintaining the 25% uh, conversion rate that they've been shown to uh, to demonstrate pretty consistently throughout their history that uh, I guess that the big story here is the fact that they have added uh, 2.5 million paying subscribers and 10 million uh, uh, um, uh, overall uh, listeners uh, 
over the, just the two and a half months essentially since they made the last announcement. So um, that's pretty impressive numbers and, and it shows really uh, huge growth, uh, potential growth for Spotify. So uh, looking at these two stories, you know, uh, uh, is the diesel one, uh, you know, of consequence to you? Do you think that was potentially the only market entry point they had in, in the U.S.? Oh, I think they've been. I think they've made some really good choices, actually, yeah. about entering the U.S. Because, you know, when you have what is almost become a commodity of the same catalog, yeah. the same price point of these on-demand streaming services, and I'm and I'm a Spotify subscriber. I'm also a Pandora subscriber, and so you know, I'm uh, and I'm I haven't yet tried Deezer Elite, and I would like to try that because I would imagine that that I would be someone who would really appreciate it. Um, but I think they made some really good choices because you can't come into a market like the U.S. and just, you know, blend in and be the same as everyone else. And, um, and so they've, they've chosen their path. The, the move music is a really interesting one just simply because the, the customer base and the entire experience that move created was around, um, like, kind of dumb handsets. They weren't... They weren't the um, they weren't smartphones, and they weren't the um, the integrated experience that everybody expects and has. So you know the the move music is a is a demographic that you know prepaid for the phones. They had a handset that had an upper limit of the number of songs that could be stored on it, and it was kind of tethered downloads was the entire experience with Cricket Move. So. I'm not sure that those are the same consumers who are going to pay for a subscription for streaming service, and I'm not sure that they have all the right equipment, but maybe that has changed since AT&T acquired them, and I think it will probably buy them a really valuable relationship with AT&T and a marketing relationship that... Yeah. Um, that is um, that will be that will potentially be really fruitful. Yeah, it, it's like a testing ground in a sense because AT and T has now lost the relationship with Beats uh, with the Apple exactly. acquisition, and now they are looking probably for something else. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I think so. I think that's good. Um, the uh, the you know, but they're but they're kind of coming in at, at you know these are two different ends of the these are two different ends of the cons consumer base in music. So. So I think the jury will be out to see whether or not they're able to um, they're able to really leverage the Cricket Move uh, customers and a marketing relationship with AT and T to to reignite that uh, particular slice, or if they're just going to then you know get more customers through marketing relationships in AT and T. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it, it would be really interesting to run down the numbers and understand sort of what the, the cost of a uh, user acquisition is in the US for a streaming user and work that into the potential 100 million deal that they've made and uh, then relate that to how much it would have cost them to get those users via traditional marketing means or online marketing means. But it's an exercise that would take a little, little bit of time, I think, to do <laughs> in any case. Yeah. And, and uh, going back to Spotify, you know, uh, obviously the company seems to be going from strength to strength. Uh, uh, do you think that the entry of uh, uh, YouTube uh, Music Key proper, uh, once it's out of beta and everybody can access it uh, at some point this year, uh, and uh, the entry of Apple uh, uh, with, with Beats might hamper the growth? Uh, of uh, of Spotify, or is it at the level where it's it's just going to continue growing just pu purely because of of, of the, you know uh, uh, communicate effects of communication, the fact that people are using it and are telling telling about the friend telling their friends about it. Well, I think Spotify has some momentum. It took them a while yeah. in the U.S. to create any sort of momentum, and I think part of that was because we've had streaming services for so long, and we've had quite a few of them, and none of them have been. You know, none of them have have completely wowed the the U.S. customer base. Um, so it's taken them a while. They globally, I think they are. You know, they're so far ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Um, the but I also think that you know what 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 Google and YouTube Music Key, how these things, what, you know, what they end up being in the marketplace is is still kind of unknown and. Um, and I would never underestimate anything that Google would do, but the what I what I predict is going to happen is that we will have you know Apple will be coming out with something we don't know what that is yet, and then there's Google Music Key, there's 
there's uh, YouTube Music Cue, excuse me, then there's Spotify, and, um, and Amazon is out there as well, and these big companies are going to be battling it out amongst yeah. themselves. And, um, and I think, you know, whether Deezer and Rhapsody and any other new entrants choose to try to battle at that level, or if they're going to try to com compete by um, targeting specific customers or specific demographics is, is yet unknown. But, um, but they all kind of have a, they all kind of have a winner takes all strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and so I'm, you know, I, I, I don't know what, how successful any of them will be at that because I think, I think the way music consumers behave is they like to dabble in lots of different things and they're it's very lifestyle oriented it's um it's something that that is it, i don't feel like anyone has completely gotten that demographic psychographic lifestyle orientation quite right in digital music and um so i think it i think that spotify it's great you know it's great that they're they're you know they're establishing on a broad scale how to become how to build a subscriber base yeah. and getting getting people's behavior on that and I think that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for other kinds of companies to come and do other small more innovative things yeah yeah absolutely uh, well Vicky it was a pleasure to have you and uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about any project that you're working on at the moment or anything you want to plug yeah, well, I will. Um, I'm doing a handful of things right now. Um, when I left Seven Digital, I was really exhausted and took a lot of time off. Put in a garden; it was great. Nice. And uh, and uh, now I'm back, and I'm excited. And um, and what I'm doing at the moment is I have kind of some adv advisory clients, and I have some consulting projects. And um, and the companies that I'm trying to work with are those that are really specifically targeting a market. Because I think there are a lot of underserved music consumers, and I don't think that it makes sense for anybody else to come in with a 9.99 subscription. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to cultivate a group of a uh, group of companies that are doing things differently. Um, one is targeting the college market. Yeah. It's beta. That one's really interesting. Another one is the Overflow, which just launched, and that is nice. um, Chris Christian Gospel at 4.99 a month subscription service, which is really great. And um, and there's the companies that are under wraps. And then I'm also working with Medem. Oh, great. And um, and representing them doing. Beast Ambassador, and they're doing their event in this year in Cannes, which will be much, much nicer than sitting in a, in a rainy tent in uh, on on the uh, on the French Riviera in January. Absolutely, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, but, and, uh, and how's it feel? How, how uh, Midem has always had a very uh, a broad uh, U.S. base. Is that going to continue to be the case? I think so. Um, I think they're they're trying to um, they're trying to be a little bit more focused on on the tech music overlay, yeah. and um, and they're going to be doing a few things differently this year at uh, in the June event. So um, so I, I still think it is is you know hands down the best entry into uh, you know as a gateway into the European and global music market where you can go. To one place and have all of the meetings that you need to have with yeah. with labels and publishers and other people in the industry yeah absolutely and that, that's a sort of my recommendation as well for for people that already know a lot of people and uh, uh, don't mind the sort of the madness of south by that's definitely you know I, I i tell people you know by all means go to south by but for those that don't yet maybe have the relationships or want to have longer conversations with people uh you know a medium is definitely much easier to find people to, to you know meet them afterwards for a drink rather than just meeting them for a business conversation and yeah it makes it a lot a lot of a smoother entry into the market and uh, well thanks so much for your time and uh, uh, oh, once again uh, you can follow Vicky on the on the handle that I'm gonna it's, it's hard to pronounce that I've, but I've put it on the it's on the video and I'm gonna put it on the website as well so you can follow her on that uh, and uh, uh, now uh, follows uh, my coverage from uh, uh, Eurosonic uh, in Groningen it's uh, great to be here uh, with uh, Siggy from Iceland Music Export at uh, Eurosonic in Groningen so hi Siggy thanks for joining me how's it going very well, actually. We're very excited. And so, uh, uh, first of all, let's start by talking about what Iceland's mu Iceland Music Export is. Uh, when did the organization start? It's a small export office that works with uh, ways of exporting music in 
doing promotions in all sorts of ways. Yeah. So you started it in, uh, in 2006, is that correct? Yes, it starts in 2000, it's formed in 2006, but it doesn't start till 2007. Right. And so essentially the objective is to highlight the, you know, the value of Icelandic music, uh, uh, both abroad, but also uh, within Iceland. Yes, and we're actually working on helping Icelandic artists do better business. Right. Because the funny thing about Iceland is that there isn't much of a music business there, but there's a large music community. So we are working with the community to, to do better business. And it's actually interesting because you have two different websites. One is uh, uh, outward facing in English and one is inward facing in Icelandic. And so what's the function of those two different sites? That highlights a bit what we do. We do uh, we're doing educational projects for the Icelandic music business or the Icelandic music community to do better business outside of Iceland. And then we have, that's in Icelandic. And then we have an English website which works as a portal for people to look at the Icelandic music from a abroad. So those are the obvious functions. That's great. And so uh, it's an interesting model, actually, because it started, it, it started with both private uh, uh, funds and public investment. So how does that work? It's mostly funded by the government, uh, like an, in an investment in the, in the, in the music business uh, from the government. But it's also funded by uh, musicians' uh, unions as well. And so um, y we can talk about the live side first because that's, that's one of the most interesting uh, parts of this. So uh, now the Iceland Music Export is running uh, Iceland Airwaves as well. So how did that come about and, and how is, is, is that evolving as, as a festival and as a showcase of Icelandic artists? Yes, uh, Iceland <coughs> Music Export took over the running of Iceland Airwaves in 2010 when actually it was run by a private company that ran into trouble after the bank crash, of course. And uh, so the festival is actually owned by Iceland Air, the airline, and IA, which is a subsidiary of Uton. So we take care of the running of the festival, but the festival is actually owned by Iceland Air, which is an airline, and ties in very much with uh, the, the philosophy of sort of cultural tourism in Iceland, which is something that Iceland Air has been trying to promote, and uh, us as well. Because it's a very, it's a very pointed and, and focused form of tourism. Yeah. We, as a government organization, stepped in and formed a subsidiary company that is a, 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 a different company. It's not really Iceland Music, Music Export. It's a different company called IA uh, Music Festival, and that's a company that runs Iceland Airwaves, and. It operates separately, but still sort of together. Uh, looking at the uh, performances of Icelandic artists abroad, uh, the number is quite staggering. It's doubled essentially from 700 to like uh, over 1400 over the past couple of years. And so what are you doing to promote uh, artists uh, uh, going outside of the country and performing at various international festivals? Well, we're doing various things. We're using our website. We're using social media a lot. <coughs> we also use events like this to put a focus on the very, very interesting Icelandic music that's coming out of Iceland, and we're helping that those musicians and the music to connect with festivals, booking agents, etc. And this has proved to work very well for us. Uh, it tells a couple of artists that are exciting at the moment, uh, a new up-and-coming bands. It's hard to pick uh, single stuff, but there's some uh, real excitement about a band called Kaleo in America. They just signed a couple of great deals in America. We have some very young and interesting artists that are here at Eurosonic as well, like Kaleo, uh, like uh, Samaris, and uh, all of the artists here are very interesting, each in their own way. We have things, everything from like Viking metal band like Skalmelt to Solstav, which is another big rock band, to over to DJ Fluid and Gamescape, who's a solo project, a girl that does bass music, which is wonderfully weird. and. Um, and in between, we have sort of bands like Samaris or even Ilya, which is a folky band, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. Uh, Iceland is a kind of an interesting market, uh, uh, as, a, as a, my listeners might not know, that uh, iTunes has never formally launched there, and Spotify only launched a, uh, a couple of years ago, really, and is, is sort of taking off slowly. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, buying music, are there still a lot of independent stores, and how does the music buying process uh, happen in Iceland? Yeah, well, the music... Uh, buying public in Iceland has basically shrunk to sort of more of the specialist yeah. thing. So the, the, the cool record stores are still open because they have a very dedicated clientele. But the big markets aren't selling music as much as they used to. So CD sales have dropped in general, but vinyl has picked up and the, the sort of niche sales are, are still pretty stable. 
But then again, a lot of the stuff has moved over to Spotify, of course. iTunes never operated in Iceland because it's too small a market for them to bother. Uh, so Icelanders have, are still buying uh, CDs with Icelandic music, but they're downloading a, well, streaming a lot of foreign music. And so, and tell me a little bit more about the involvement with Eurosonic. Uh, have you been here before, and h- how do you find this this uh, this event uh, uh, over the years, and, and this year in particular? This is my third time here with Iceland Music Export, and I'm getting to know it a lot better, and it's very exciting for me also to be like in focus now. But I've been here twice before, playing as a musician. Awesome. Well, 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 do you play in a band? I played with a lot of bands. Yes, I, I was here with Emiliano Torini, oh, wow. and I was here with a guy called Pietro Pien. And I've also been here with my own project called Steintrekur, which is a, an odd thing. Fantastic. And in terms of uh, sort of the Alisa music export, what, what do you hope to get from uh, you know, being involved in, in Eurosonic in such a, such a big way? Of course, we, we hope to create better business for the Icelandic music community, and that's our goal. And you have like four, 14 bands, or how many bands here? 19 now. 19 bands. So uh, obviously I'll, I'll drop a link into the show notes as well of my show and people can go and check out the bands as well uh, once they finish listening. Uh, thanks so much, Sigi, for your time. Thank you very much. You can also go to icelanderrupts.com, which is our website with all things Icelandic here. It's fantastic. It's icelanderrupts.com. And thanks for listening to Digital Music Trends at uh, Eurosonic 2015.